for you. And we're grateful for the gifts God has given us. Thank you, Ruth. And we wanted to celebrate a little bit today. You know, God has been good to us throughout this pandemic. We have so many things to be thankful for. And so we put together just a little video uh, to say how much we are thankful for you, uh, how much we are thankful for God's provision during these last six months, uh, the ability we've had to do things in a different way to reach people for Jesus. Our prayer is that people during this time of difficulty would look to him because he, I know, has changed my life and brings me peace even in these difficult times. So let's, as a church family, watch this video together. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Scenes that I cannot see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name. church and my sister and I'm also happy that I have my mom in my life your dad and my dad thankful for the family I have here I'm thankful for my friends yeah. we're thankful, thankful for, for our family, family. thankful my mom for cleaning up the house and then thankful for God who created us and made us both Thanks, is... Happy Thanksgiving, God. It's great to look back, isn't it, and see the goodness that God has uh, given to us that we can celebrate today and always. Uh, just a few announcements for this morning, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, just a reminder that today we're so grateful for the opportunity. Uh, we are handing out uh, 50 meals 
to our friends in Maybell uh, and those people who uh, need a nice warm meal, a nice warm hug. We can't give it to them physically, but we're glad we can give them food and we're going to give some a hair package. And so we've been busy on the phone this week. We put posters up and allowed people to call to request it. And so thank you. There were many people that donated food. Uh, it's going to be, I really hope, a blessing to some folks who have difficulty getting out and are lonely this time of year. We hope we can share the love of Jesus with them with the food and the care package. Wednesday, we get together for a Zoom prayer meeting. Watch your email for a link for that. Uh, also, thank you to Andrew. There's a young adults. Uh, Bible study at uh, 7 p.m. So uh, we hope that you also can uh, join us. Uh, any young adults are welcome for that. And uh, watch the Instagram page for a link to join that Bible study. And just another announcement we wanted to make. Usually, it's a tradition in our church on this Sunday to have shoe boxes all over the front of the church because we love to support Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse. Well, this year is a little different, and we were a bit nervous about sending people out to stores when we all know we shouldn't be going out if we don't need to. So we're offering a few other options for caring for others at Thanksgiving this year. And we're going to run a project from today, Thanksgiving, until Christmas. That gives us about six weeks to think about how we can support these projects. If you still want to donate to Samaritan's Purse, you can even pat a virtual shoebox online. So if you visit Operation Christmas Child online, you can still contribute to that if you'd like to. But we've been made aware of two orphanages. One that is in Lebanon and has a lot of uh, Syrian children, refugees come to Lebanon, and the other one is in Honduras, and it's called Casa Hogar, which means the house or the home, and there's many children in Honduras because of violence and um, different reasons that they are orphans, and we know the Bible tells us to take care of orphans and widows, and it's a pleasure to be able to, uh, we'd like to start today, if you'd like to give to this project, you can uh, put it on your offering or you can donate online and let us know that you'd like the money to go towards this special project. And so here we are, someone from Honduras, a missionary is sharing about what they're doing at the uh, Cafe Casa Hogar. My name is Melody Francis. I'm a missionary at Casa Hogar Vida y Libertad in Honduras, where my role is uh, to be a social service worker slash mother slash tutor. <laughs> Every follower of Christ is called to care for orphans. And in the context of Honduras specifically, there is a major problem of poverty and violence and the population that is most vulnerable are the children. In Honduras, uh, there are about 170,000 children that are considered orphans. And that means uh, that they don't have the option for a family. So either their parents are dead or they come from abandonment, abuse, uh, parents are in prison. Uh, I mean, they can't be, they don't have a family. So Casa Hogar, which in Spanish means house home, uh, aims to provide a home for these children and to give them a sense of family, a sense of belonging, and to uh, provide for their material needs, which are food, shelter, education, medical assistance, but mostly to guide them into a path of healing and to give them the opportunity to know Jesus and to experience His love and His grace. The goals that we have for the, the kids is to break the cycle, uh, for, that they can heal, that they can learn to know God as their father because they are fatherless children on earth, but they have a father and that they become agents of change in society, that they become responsible adults, and that in their turn, they can spread Jesus' love and grace around them. We had a huge moment of joy this year. Uh, two of our boys, our older boys, uh, teenagers, uh, decided to be baptized. And this is a major step for them because they well, obviously come from a very rough background if they are at the home but also have had a tough, um, would we say, teenagehood. And for them to have come to this decision and the motive behind it, that is that they want to follow Christ and this is the next step, was, uh, it was a huge, it was a huge thing for us, yeah. 
affair is in the midst of assuming full responsibility of Casa Ogar, taking over from a Spanish mission that founded the ministry over 18 years ago. The goal of this project is to raise $110,000. 60000 of this will be used to transition the property and assets from the Spanish mission. One-third of the other $50,000 will be used to provide a roof over a play area on the property so that children can use this year-round. The remainder will cover the gap until an expanded children's sponsorship program is in place, paying for the children's education, food, lodging, medical care, and clothing. Through FAIR, our fellowship churches and members have contributed generously to the ministry of Casa Ogar since Melody's arrival. We are asking you once again to give generously so the fatherless children of Honduras can be given a fresh start. Hello everyone and ha happy Thanksgiving Canada. In keeping with the uh, Thanksgiving holiday here in Canada, I invite you to reflect with me on uh, what it means to give thanks, to have a biblical understanding of Thanksgiving uh, through Paul's message in his first letter to the Thessalonians. Uh, he encourages uh, all of us to give thanks in all circumstances. His encouragement is threefold. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for that is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. It's a call to us as God's people and as followers of Christ to have a joyful heart, not only once in a while or when things are going well, but always. To pray without ceasing, not only when we feel like praying or during our set times during the day, but as we go about our day to have a heart that is inclined to God and to give thanks, not for everything, but in all things, no matter what we are going through. Some of us might be thinking, um, wait a minute, Paul, uh, have you, did you have a pandemic during your time? Do you know what we're going through, what the world is going through right now with the coronavirus? Do you know that the sickness is going around? Do you know that lives have been turned upside down? People have lost their jobs. People are grieving the loss of their loved ones. Many are separated from loved ones and unable to care because of their restrictions. Mental health has skyrocketed, challenges and so on and so on. Paul must be smiling because we should know that when he wrote these letters to the churches, several times he was in prison or going through suffering himself. And yet his strength is in the joy of the Lord and he encourages the people of God, hold fast, keep steadfast hearts and fix your eyes on Jesus. Can we be excused or take a pass from thanksgiving, from giving thanks, from greeting each other, a happy Thanksgiving or having joyful hearts because of what we're going through right now. Paul isn't implying that we deny what we might be facing. He's not suggesting that we pretend that things are okay, that it will go away, and that we all we have to do is to think positively. No, those are quite hollow things to think about. He's not asking us to be thankful that someone is sick or that we lost our jobs or that we're going through pain and suffering. No, that's not what he's saying. What Paul is saying is to give thanks in all situations, to be joyful even in difficult times, to pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Why? Because that is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. And that is the way we are called to live as Christians. How is that possible? It's easy for me, for us to say. It's easy for us to read these words from, from the book, from God's word. How is it possible? It is to seek the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to strengthen our hearts and to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness 
in Psalm 107, the psalmist starts with, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. The psalmist didn't say that because he was just thinking about the goodness of God without actually experiencing the goodness and faithfulness of God. Psalm 107 is a song of thanksgiving, a corporate thanksgiving, and encourages all who are redeemed, let all the, all the redeemed say so, for they have been delivered from trouble, from trouble, gathered in from north and south, from the east and west. And we are encouraged to do the same, the church community. Let the church of God, the people of God, say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his faithfulness endures forever. What can you be thankful for? What can you and I be thankful for in the midst of sickness? We can thank God for doctors, nurses, for a healthcare system. We can thank God for a church community who prays with us. That was a very beautiful video to reflect on the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God during times of trouble. We can thank God for our teachers, for frontline workers in all sectors, for the beautiful changing colors of the season. It is a good habit to ponder on these things. In fact, it's a good habit to write them daily on a journal. The psalmist who wrote 107 says, those of you who are wise reflect on these things. Think of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. More than these, we thank God for his indescribable gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. We can thank God that we can walk confidently in his promises. We thank God that nothing can separate us from his love. We can thank God that the suffering that we might be going through right now during the pandemic is momentary, temporary, nothing compared to the glorious life that awaits us when we join him for all God's children. And that is his promise and his promises are true. And so I encourage you the same way that Paul encourages the different churches of his time to th give thanks to God for his faithful love that endures forever. And to never forget that he is with us. Jesus promises he is with us and will be with us to the very end. Happy Thanksgiving. Just um, about 10 years ago, some of some of you uh, that were here about 10 years ago might remember a lady named Christina. She had a son named Matthew and Dawson. And I do have, uh, for those of you that remember who Christina was, um, I do have some bad news. And uh, Christina, I'm not sure what happened, but she actually uh, died this past week. So if you remember her, uh, for those of you who were here at that time, uh, Christina went home to be with the Lord. Um, so she leaves behind uh, two boys. Matthew and Dawson, so please pray for them. I think Matthew is about 14 years old now, and Dawson's probably about 10, so I'm not sure exactly. I couldn't figure out, but I know that her uh, um, former uh, boyfriend uh, just let us know this past week, so let's make sure that we pray uh, pray for, for uh, those folks. Also, um, uh, we need to pray for... Uh, uh, John Lynn, uh, John is headed out to uh, Whistler. It's Whistler, right? Yes, yeah, headed out to Whistler on December 1st. So he'll be driving out there. He got a job, so we're grateful for that. But we do need to pray. It, I think it's about 50 kilometers to Whistler. No, it's about 5,000 kilometers to Whistler. So uh, it's, a, it's a long way to go. Vin and Gloria, you did that trip the other year, didn't you? How many hours was that? You don't know. <laughs> you were with Vin, so the time just went by, just like that. <laughs> uh, so, but we do need to pray, and we're thankful for that. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We come to you uh, as ones, uh, even as we've been reminded that we are to be a people of gratitude, and, and the thing that keeps us focused is, is uh, the cross that you died upon and how you 
gave your life that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who uh, you sent to us, who indwells us. And uh, so we, uh, and we just pray that you'd find us holding on to your promises and being a people of gratitude along the way. We also, we pray uh, for John as he's getting ready to uh, go and um, take this new job. We pray for your safety for him as he travels, but also as he settles there that he would find a church, uh, that he, uh, his faith would continue to grow and that uh, for his uh, testimony to those that he'll work with. And we also pray for his protection from any um, influences that might, uh, might lead him astray by, by mistake. And so we just pray, Lord, for him and we commit him to you. We also pray for our students. We think of our college students as they're on break this week and as they study and they seek to get a little bit of a recovery time. We pray for their refreshment. For our other students as they're in school, for their safety, for our teachers and all that are working on our behalf. We pray uh, that, that we might soon see uh, some vaccines develop, but also in the meantime, as, we, uh, that, as we're careful and uh, we, we pray, uh, and we pray for those that are not feeling well. We pray that for their recovery and for, uh, we think of those that are also, as, even as Marion mentioned, uh, not able to see their families because of being in other countries and, and the loneliness that's there. And so we pray for your comfort uh, for those that are experiencing this difficulty. We, f we also thank Lord of uh, Matthew and Dawson. We think of these two boys now without their mom. Uh, we pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit to them, that they, you would draw them to yourself in this time of trouble. Uh, whoever is going to be looking after them, Lord, we pray for patience and strength uh, as they go through this difficult time. We also thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to um, hand out some food today. And uh, Lord, uh, you've opened this door for us. We're grateful. We pray for those that will receive it, uh, for the Gospel of John that we'll be sending and along with it. And we ultimately, Lord, we're, we're thankful for that we can serve in, a, in such a concrete fashion, but we also pray that your Holy Spirit would draw those uh, that, that receive your word to yourself in faith and trust and repentance, that they might know you and, and as Savior and Lord. We pray now you would help us as we look into your word, and we thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn with me to... Uh, Acts chapter 6, and we're going to be doing um, kind of a, a big picture approach to the book of Acts this morning, in the sense that we're going to survey, um, survey chapter 6 to 10, but through the lens of uh, seeing uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Uh, we began a series last week and the series, uh, st we started in Acts chapter 1, and we noticed um, that there's a key, actually, let's see, uh, what's the title of today's lesson? Acts 6 to 10, and how the Holy Spirit empowered the followers of Jesus to carry out the mission of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In fact, if you look at the flow of the entirety of the book, it is uh, followers of Jesus uh, who heard, and not only heard directly from Christ, but then the message and command of Christ was passed down. Here's your mission. And so there's a slide, I believe, Emily. Um, go, go, if you go right ahead. Yeah, so there's the key verse. If you're saying, well, what is Acts after 1, verse 8? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus, uh, similarly in Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, said to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is, and it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that the, we see our brothers and sisters of old carrying out Christ's command. And so when we think about what is my mission in life, you know, one of the things that sort of been beneficial to me uh, through, just through reflection in the last six months is, um, it just being reinforced me is we think, well, what is my purpose here on earth? What is, what is my identity? And we're constantly reminded from the Bible what our identity is. We are the followers of Jesus Christ under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he's given each of us a mission. And the mission is the same one. Preach the gospel and invite people to follow Jesus. Act, call people to repent of their sins and put their faith in Christ. And then we realize immediately that that uh, people coming to Christ is, is not in our power. 
you can't make someone become a Christian. I can't make someone become a Christian. How does a person become a follower of Jesus Christ? It's by the, by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And so when the believers went and they preached Christ um, crucified and raised from the dead and called people to repent of their sins and said, if, when you believe upon Jesus Christ, uh, you will, you'll have the forgiveness of your sins and you'll have eternal life, but you need to put your faith in Christ. You need to turn from your sin. Uh, they went in obedience, but, it's, but when people responded, it wasn't because of their oratorical skill. It was because of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And we see that as, our, as a mission. So when you and I go, we go, we say, okay, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you. Give me strength. Give me courage. But ultimately, any fruit is, is the result of the Holy Spirit. As it regards the Holy Spirit, just a, a few reminders. Um, the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the triune Godhead. Uh, he is the one who led and directed Christ, the one who empowered Christ in his earthly ministry, the one by whom Christ spoke and taught. And we see all this begin at Christ's baptism. Uh, when the Father spoke from heaven and the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus and then immediately Christ was led out into the wilderness. Uh, by the Holy Spirit's indwelling of us, the promise of Christ to always be with us is kept. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. How did he keep that promise? By sending us the Holy Spirit. Um, as for the, when we think about the reception of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that you'll uh, be noting as you read along through these first 10 chapters of Acts is at times the apostles are laying their hands on people that have put their faith in Christ, and it's upon the laying on of their hands that the person receives the Holy Spirit. So a natural question to ask is, okay, I'm a little bit confused because there's the, the believers that were obedient to Christ. Jesus said, wait in the city until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. They were gathered for worship and prayer. The Holy Spirit descended upon them. It looked like flaming tongues that came upon them, and then they began to speak in the languages of those that were, had gathered from other countries to worship uh, the Lord in, in Jerusalem. But then we see like, these apostles laying their hands on people and are like, well, how does one receive the Holy Spirit? And the, and the normative means is, though we see this sort of transitional phase, let's call it, in the, in the book of Acts, where the Bible says very clearly in Ephesians chapter 1 that it is at the moment a person believes that they receive the Holy Spirit. And so there's a little bit of flux that you see in the text. Uh, but then we realize as we go through that, that, uh, that no, today, it's at the moment that you give your life to Christ, at that moment of conversion, at that moment of repentance and faith, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, and also when we, uh, when we see the experience of the believers as, the, as we work through the book of Acts, we see that's a normative way. So that's just to clear up any question you have about when does a person receive the Holy Spirit. Um, we also learned, uh, as a reminder, uh, when uh, we become, became a Christian, um, it's at that moment that the Holy Spirit gives a person a spiritual gift, something that you didn't have before that is a work of God in your life. And that gift is not our choosing. Um, we don't ask afterwards, God, I don't want that particular gift. I want something else. No, the Bible says, fan into the flame the gift that you've received. Uh, and the, the, sing, the primary purpose of the gifts God gives us is for the building up of the body of Christ. And so when we talk about gathering together, uh, we gather together in obedience to Christ, but that's how we work, work out and, and, and serve. Uh, and so we, the, the, the importance of Christian fellowship, walking and working side by side together uh, as believers. Now this morning, um, we're going to do a survey of Acts 6 to 10. And in Acts 6 to 10, basically, when I was thinking about the, I was kept reading, it's about a half an hour. If you listen to Acts 6 to 10 on your, uh, on your morning walk, it's about a half an hour listen. If you read it, uh, it's about a 15-minute read. But the thing that I was paying attention to this week was I thought, okay, well, how do I see um, the work of the Holy Spirit as the, as, as the book of Acts progresses? And every chapter uh, um, uh, that, that I read this week, there's, there's explicit references to, to how the Holy Spirit was moving and working in the believers' lives, and then we see the fruit um, that is wrought of the Holy Spirit's work. And so chapter 6, for example, in chapter 6, 
go, uh, go ahead. Our first stop. Um, in chapter 6, 1 to 7, there is some Hellenistic Jews, which means they're, they're Greek-speaking Jews that had, uh, had come together um, from other parts of the world because the, the, the common language was uh, Greek. And then there's the Hebraic Jews, the ones who were, who were the old way, uh, who, were in, who, had, who had never been cast into dis, uh, and dispersed, but who had been in the land of Israel. And there is some conflict, and one of the things that's unfortunate, uh, and it's going to be part of our lives, no matter how old you are, where you are, there's going to be conflict between people. Um, and, and whether it's in the home, in the church, in the workplace, conflict is, just hap- happens along the way because we're sinners. Uh, and, and, that's, and so it happens. And so even in the church, there's this conflict. There's complaining because here's, there's, they're doing some good work. They're handing out food to those that are in need. But then someone's like, well, how come, you, how come everyone who's the Hebraic Jews get the food first? And then some of our Hellenistic widows, are, there's not enough for them left at the end of the day. And so it's, it's a, someone noticed something. There was, there was some favoritism, it seems, that was going on. And this thing threatens the church and threatens the church's unity. And so it says the disciples get together and it says, so the 12 gathered, all the disciples, then they said, it's not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We're going to hand this responsibility over to them. And we, we're going to give attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, and so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. They also chose Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And so we see the resolution of their problem, but at the core of it is they make this choice. They're like, okay, um, here's the problem, but here's, then we notice what is the solution? Choose seven men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And when I thought about that, and it's an interesting lesson, but it it bears uh, some thought. What is the primary qualification for one serving in ministry in the church? It has nothing to do with I went to this school or I can sing this well or I've got this talent. It has everything, their choice. They didn't, find, they didn't say go to the local business school and find someone that's good in administration that believes in the policy of fairness between Greek Jews and, Hel- and Hebraic Jews. No, it's, it, they said f- go and find the seven most godly people you can find who are full of the Holy Spirit. They are the ones and, and you're like, wait a second, isn't that kind of below them? If you're going to go find the seven most godly people, and then you're like, your job is to hand out food to the widows. And you're like, well, why didn't you pick them to do some other bigger task? Because there's no bigger task than helping the poor, isn't there? Uh, and, being, and having a servant's heart. Go find seven servants uh, who are committed to Christ and who have evidenced the working of the Holy Spirit in their life. Uh, and, and the application is, is that when we think about open positions in the church, the challenge here is, is if there's an open position, go find someone that's filled with the Holy Spirit to fill it. Uh, because it, that's how God works and moves, is when, when you put people that are in love with Jesus Christ in positions to serve. And it has nothing to do with our estimation of how important a position is because this is a position of serving at tables and they said it's vitally important that we find the most godly people to do this ministry and so it makes us think about how we do church Um, and and we see ultimately there's like find a person that's filled with the holy spirit the second uh, stop along our way is um, one of the men that was chosen was a guy named stephen And Stephen, and so he's one of the gentlemen that's um, serving tables, but we also discover that he, by the power of God and power of the Holy Spirit working through him, he's also a preacher. So his service of the table doesn't stop him from preaching, 
but he also, through him, the Holy Spirit, there's many miracles that are done um, through Stephen. And he begins to engage uh, people in, um, and he's, in one of the most famous uh, sermons there is in the scripture in terms of, here's a quick overview of Israel's entire history. So when you read chapter seven, which is a long read to be quite honest, um, but he just step by step says, here's the history of God's people. But as he lays out the history of God's people, he continues to illustrate that um, the unfaithfulness of, of the Jews in responding to God's message and calling to repentance. And then he finishes up his uh, sermon by, um, and the reason he, he ends up with this defense is because here he was engaging some folks who then slandered him. So he's preaching in, in the city of Samaria uh, and no one can stand against him or his wisdom. They see the powerful miracles that, that the Holy Spirit is, is working through him. But behind it all, even as he's committed to God, people are, false charges are brought against him. So he's taken to Jerusalem and he's before the Sanhedrin, which is the, the group of 70, the chief 70 religious officials. And it's there that he gives this history of Israel's history, a uh, history of, of Israel. And, and as he gets to the end of his, his message, he then um, cuts to the quick in verse, chapter seven, verse 51. He calls them stiff necked people. Um, and he says, your hearts are still uncircumcised and you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And at that point, they freak out, um, right? Uh, they, he had had them in tow as he painted their history, um, but then he, he, he heads right for the jugular and not by his own wisdom, because, but he's a man who's led by the Holy Spirit. So he's, he's preaching and speaking as led by the Holy Spirit. And his words to them is, you actually have a long history of, re of rejecting and resisting the work of God, you rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's at that point um, that they decide we've had enough of this guy uh, and they, they proceed. Uh, and then he actually, it's amazing. He's, he then, um, he actually said, hey, I can actually, it says that heaven opened, that he could see Jesus in heaven. Uh, and when he says that he saw Jesus in heaven, it's at that point they decide we're going to kill this guy. And he's then dragged out of, of the council chambers, the courtroom chambers, and they stone him to death. And we know this account because it says there's a guy there that's approving of his death and his name is Saul. Uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about Saul in a few minutes. But the thing that's, that's there is when we think about the subject of resisting the Holy Spirit, um, his charge is, you've been resisting the Holy Spirit, you've been resisting his convicting work, and you are just, you just want to, you're doing your own thing. Uh, and, in, and in my life and in your life, um, the, the, the warning there is, is that you and I would be sensitive to God's leading. Uh, you know, there's going to be moments in our life when God is whispering to our heart and saying, I want you to do that, I want you to do this thing, and, I don't, and at other times it'll be like, you shouldn't do that. And we feel this internal struggle that's happening where we, part of us wants to do what God's t telling us to do and part of us wants to do our own thing. And, and, and we, when we know that it's a spiritual battle uh, and, and when we look at this, the call is, is don't resist the Holy Spirit. We are to be people who are spirit led and, and spirit directed. We wanna be spirit empowered people. And so when we hear God's voice and we're like, I know what the right thing to do is. I kind of want to do the wrong thing, but I also, I need to listen to what God is saying. I need to obey the command of the Holy Spirit and, and continue to do what's right in his, in his sight. Uh, and, and so the, the warning there is, is do not resist the Holy Spirit, his commands, his conviction, his leading, um, or the words that he's putting in our mouths. Because sometimes we'll be like, I really know I should say such and such, but I'm afraid to say it. Well, if we know what we're supposed to say uh, and we're afraid, it's the fear that's the problem, not if the words are the right words. And so we say, Lord, help me to be obedient to you and to say what I'm supposed to say. Because at times we'll feel very compelled internally to say something or do something. And we're saying, is this, 
this is my is this my own thought or is this something that it looks like the Holy Spirit is trying to use me at this particular point? And the third, our third stop today is Acts chapter. Oh, that's not chapter six. I got that wrong. Acts chapter sev seven. Is it seven or eight? Um, it's eight actually. So ignore the the reference there. Uh, Acts chapter eight, and and we're gonna jump from Stephen to a guy named Philip. Philip is another of the seven that were set apart to wait upon tables. And when we come into Acts chapter 8, um, Phil, it talks about Philip, and so persecution has broken out against the church. Stephen is murdered. Um, Saul is there approving of it, and it says there's persecution that breaks out against the church. I noticed a little thing that I hadn't noticed before, um, uh, that when on the day, it says on that day in chapter 8, a great persecution broke out against the church. And it says all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. And I thought, oh, that's very interesting because the last time something went down when Jesus was arrested and crucified, Jesus' apostles, they scattered. But I see that they learned a, they learned a lesson. Um, they actually scattered stayed, stood their ground and stayed where they were in the city. But the, but the neat thing is, is persecution is actually not a bad thing when it comes to the church. We, none of us like the idea of being persecuted for our faith. And yet the consistency of the testimony of scripture is, is when God's people who are truly committed to him have to go other places, that God uses that to spread the message of Jesus. And that's exactly what happens because this guy, Philip, he flees the city of Jerusalem, but he doesn't quit being a Christian. Because it says in, in verse four, um, those that had been scattered, they preached the word wherever they went. Philip went to Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. He also happened to be, able, he performed miracles by the power of, of the Holy Spirit. And, peop, and it says, with many shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, and so there was great joy in that city. And then in the passage that follows, um, Philip, because of his, the preaching and because of the miracles that were being done, there's a guy in Samaria who was a sorcerer, and his name was Simon the Sorcerer, and people actually called the guy the great power of God. Um, and he, he was involved in witchcraft, he was, uh, was involved in, in magic arts, and he had been doing some stuff over the years, and people were following this guy, and all of a sudden he sees Philip, and he's like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. And as you read the account, people are committing their lives to Christ, and after watching everyone else and how they're responding to Christ, Simon the Sorcerer's like, okay, I'm going to sign up too. Um, he's not a real conversion. Um, it's only after he sees what everyone else is doing that he casts his lot in with Jesus. Uh, and and the, the, the falseness of his faith is seen that when, when the apostles back in Jerusalem hear what's happening in Samaria, it says that uh, there's, a, there's a couple of them. Peter comes um, and he comes and they're laying their hand, hands upon these new believers and they're receiving the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then Simon sees this and he's like, you know, I've got a pretty big bank account. I'm going to offer a huge amount of money because I want to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, and and then, Peter, then Peter calls him out. He says, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. So we know he's not a real follower because he's like, oh, I've been doing all these magic tricks for all these years. Um, and, uh, but now I see that there's a, there's, there's power I haven't tapped into. I think I'll just offer to buy it, which is very offensive when you think about it. Um, but then it does make me think today, we are, we live in a world where there's people who are multimillionaires who are peddlers of, of fa faith on TV, isn't there? Who claim to be able to do miracles who go through all these antics of knocking you down by the Holy Spirit and all this other supposed stuff. And yet, what is the fruit of it? We just see them with mansion after mansion and private jet after private jet. And I'm like, is there any difference between them and this guy who's seeking to 
somehow gain, go up the, the ladder because he's like, oh, I, I want to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's sad how many people are deceived by these ones today. And then it gives all the rest of us who are trying to follow Christ a bad name because we're always having to explain away why that guy on the TV or, or why that person, woman on the TV is always asking for money and pretending to do things. Uh, and, and so the, here's the warning of Simon. And the, and the message is, is the Holy Spirit, when, when you become a follower of Jesus, you get a gift and you're supposed to use that gift. And it's for the building up of the body of Christ. It's not for lining your pockets with money. And it's not for bringing attention to ourself. It's all about the glorification of Christ and and, and the spread of God's kingdom. The the four stop along the way. And so, uh, well, actually, Philip's story, he he continues his story. He has a neat um, encounter with, you know, I always find the Ethiopian connection a really wild thing. Um, He has, remember uh, Solomon? And you think, well, how, what's the, how does the, where does the Ethiopian connection come, with, come from? It goes all the way back to the time of Solomon when the Ethiopian queen came up to visit Solomon. And we looked into some of the, the rumors that went around that. Um, and yet, all these hundreds of years later, here's an Ethiopian official coming to Jerusalem to worship God. And he also happens to have a copy of Isaiah the prophet's scroll. And so something's going on in Ethiopia. Um, that there's, there's folks that will come to, to Jerusalem to worship. But there's this guy on a chariot, and the Holy Spirit directs Philip. He says, I want you to go down from Jerusalem and just down this road. And, you know, sometimes I say, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit's going to lead us, and we're like, this doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? Well, just imagine you're Philip, and, and, and the Holy Spirit speaking to him is like, go from Jerusalem and take this particular road down and just do what I say. And lo and behold, it's that afternoon that he happens across this Ethiopian official who is in his chariot and who's confused as he's reading the book of Isaiah. And he's happening to be reading from uh, that amazing messianic passage of Isaiah 52 and 53, which is all about the suffering servant, the person of Jesus Christ, and it's speaking of the sufferings that Jesus would go through. And so he's got some questions about the passage. And so just so happens that God has arranged for Philip to be there. And Philip knows that the passage is about Jesus, and he explains, um, explains the passage, points him to Christ, and then the guy gets baptized, and at that very moment, then it says the Holy Spirit transported him to another place, which is a miracle, uh, which reminds us of, of the ascension of Elijah, as it, there's some touch points that are there. But it's an amazing example of how do I see the Holy Spirit's involvement in the spread of the gospel um, and I, we see people who are spirit-led, spirit-empowered, and when they're speaking, because they devoted their life to Christ and they're, they're, they're pursuing holiness and righteousness, God is speaking through them. And then we see people coming to Jesus and lives being changed as people come to Christ. And so that's, that's uh, Philip. Um, that's Philip's account. But then we come to our fourth stop, and we're almost done because you can see we've got five dots, so it means when we get to the fifth dot, we're out of here. Um, uh, uh, but it's, uh, what's the fourth stop? The fourth stop is, as we think about the, the working of the Holy Spirit who empowers the followers of Jesus, and that includes us. We can't live the Christian life unless the Holy Spirit's working through us. End of story. Uh, we can't do it in our own strength. Um, Paul, well, he becomes Paul, but Saul, the very guy who is at uh, approving of Stephen's murder, um, he is on, he, he's, getting, he's, he's persecuting the church. He's arresting all known Christians in Jerusalem, but he's not satisfied at that. He actually, in chapter 9, he receives letters um, from, from, the, from the other priests and the officials to go to other synagogues. There's about 400 synagogues in Jerusalem. In, Israel at this time. So you've got the temple, but he had all these uh, local meetings, just like we have churches today. They had synagogues scattered throughout all Israel. There's about 400 of them. And so he gets letters um, so that he can go and introduce himself at other synagogues and say, hey, can you help me find the Christians that are in town? Uh, And and Saul is on his way um, with letters, and he's headed to Damascus, and that's when he encounters Jesus. It says in the passage that as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him 
And he then fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's like, who are you? I am Jesus who are you, you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And Saul is blinded through this. Those that are with him, they saw the light, but they didn't, they didn't understand what was going on. They lead him by the hand into the city. There happens to be a man, a believer there named Ananias. The Holy Spirit speaks to Ananias and says, um, there's a guy named Saul in town and you are to go and you're to lay your hands on him uh, and you're to pray for him. Um, and Ananias is like, uh, I heard this guy was really, really bad. <laughs> And God says, this guy is my chosen servant to preach the gospel within, to the rest of the world. Um, and he's going to suffer a lot of things for my name. But he's my chosen instrument to do this. And so then Ananias is like, okay, I'm going to do what you, you've commanded me to do. And so Ananias goes and, and lays his hands upon him. Um, it says he placed his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul. The Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again and he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul then began to preach in that city of Damascus and confounded everybody who heard because he's proving that Jesus was the Messiah. They try to kill him. He sneaks out of the, he's led out of the city at night uh, in a basket, and he escapes. Uh, he then goes to Jerusalem. Um, the, pe the people in Jerusalem are afraid of the guy. Then we're introduced to a fellow named Barnabas who says, you know, I, it looks like he's a real Christian. I'm going to take a chance on him. Uh, and he takes Paul under his wing and introduces Paul to the church. Uh, and, it says, and then it says, um, at that point, then things died down in terms of persecution. And it says the church enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear, in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. You know, when, I, when we think about the working of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our, in our life, um, you know, he convicts us of our sin. He helps us understand the word of God. He empowers us. He puts his words in our mouths. He's given us a gift. He's the seal, a guarantee, deposit of our heavenly inheritance. But you know, there's times when you and I are feeling overwhelmed and the Bible speaks about the role of the Holy, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to encourage us, to remind us of the things of Christ, to remind us of our home, to, and to, to, to minister to our soul, just like there's times when you and I don't know how to pray. It actually says in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit helps us uh, with words that, that, we, that we, helping us in our prayer itself. And so there's the encouraging work of the Holy Spirit and the church experienced it. And our last stop is... Um, in, is in chapter 9 and 10, um, and, and I'll go through it quickly, is we are introduced, so now the story changes to Peter. So we, we, we talked about Stephen, we saw Philip, now we've seen how um, Saul uh, encounters Christ and is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there's an account about Peter, and Peter being, a, he has this vision one day um, where there's all these animals and and God says, you know, get up and kill and eat any, any of those animals. And Peter objects. He's like, God, uh, you know that there's, you know, the food laws. Well, I've never touched some of those animals in my life. And I'm not about to now. And, and, God's, and in the vision that he has, God's like, I just told you to get up and kill and eat. Uh, and, and the lesson was, was that God now had made all food acceptable. It's paving the way. So what's God doing? It's paving the way for Gentiles to be brought into the church and Jews and Gentiles to walk together as one uh, because food divided them. Uh, that was one of the things. The other thing that divided them was Peter. In fact, he's, he, he's then, at the, all the time he's wrestling with this and God's speaking to him, there's a Roman centurion who's a follower of God. Not a, he's not a follow, yet a follower of Jesus. He's, he's, a, he's a devout follower of God who's trying to follow the Old Testament laws. Uh, and an angel has appeared to him and said, your prayers have been heard, um, and I've seen your, the, the life that you've been living, uh, and I've got something for you. Uh, and so the, the, the Lord tells this Roman centurion where Saul is staying and who he's staying with. And so the, this Roman centurion sends two of his servants 
to Simon the Tanner's house because God's told him that's where the guy that you're supposed to listen to is staying right now. And Peter, meanwhile, is like, I don't understand the meaning of this whole vision. Well, God's preparing his heart because when, he, when ultimately the centurion servants, they find Saul exactly where God says that Saul's going to be. Saul, because he's just been talking to God, goes with those two servants and comes back to the Roman centurion's house. And one of the things, that, and we see how um, remarkable it is, because Peter, uh, Peter says, um, let me see, he says, when, as soon as he gets in the door, and I, I would encourage you, if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, it's an amazing account. He goes inside the door, he says, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate or visit with a Gentile. And so that's the first words out of his mouth. <laughs> I shouldn't be here, right? But, but he was sent by God. And, and the, the most amazing thing is, um, he says, why am I here? Cornelius talks about how he was praying and how an angel appeared to him um, and how he was to send for Peter. And, and this is the most amazing invitation we'll ever read of. He says, we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything God has commanded you to tell us. Talk about an open door for talking about Jesus. He says, I've got an entire household of people right here and whatever it is God has commanded you to say as his follower, we're here to listen today. That's incredible. You and I, that, those, are the, those are the moments that you and I live for something like that, that God has commanded you to tell me something, tell me everything God has told you to tell me. Uh, and, and Peter preaches Christ and, and the entire group um, turn to Jesus and believe. And then the most amazing thing is, and this circles us all the way back and then we're done, is um, the experience of these Gentiles that day was identical to the experience of the Jews in the upper room in Jerusalem. Uh, as in the same fashion as the Holy Spirit came upon the, the gathered believers in Jerusalem, it says that the Holy Spirit descended upon those believers that day after they heard the message, they heard the call to repent, they heard about Jesus, they put their faith in Christ, and it says they, and that the Holy Spirit came upon them uh, and then they began to speak in tongues. And Peter realizes, wait a second, my vision of God's plan of salvation is way bigger now. I thought that God was just going to save Jewish people. But now I realize that Christ was sent for all people. And so we see that really it's a second Pentecost experience because the reception of the Holy Spirit, you go to the last slide please, Sid. The reception of the Holy Spirit um, came exactly as he did upon the Jewish believers. And so in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, is there? We're, we're one in Jesus Christ. And so we see the movement of the church. And so quickly, and we close, ministry positions, there's a necessary qualification. One is filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, we mustn't resist the calling or leading or commands of the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit, his gifts and power are something that can't be bought or manipulated. Uh, salvation happens when a person encounters Jesus and obeys his call, and the Holy Spirit is completely involved in a person becoming a Christian. Um, the Holy Spirit not only leads, empowers us and leads us, he ministers to us in our time of need. And lastly, salvation and the filling of the Holy Spirit is for all people who come to Christ. And we see that at this amazing day when Peter is in this Roman centurion's house. And he's like, you know, I shouldn't be here. And the guy's like, um, whatever God has commanded you to tell us, you tell us about Jesus. Uh, and then they receive the Holy Spirit in the same fashion as the Jews had. And so what are you and I supposed to be doing as Christians? We're supposed to, we are to obey the command of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Our mission is clear. How in the world are we to accomplish it? The only way to accomplish it is to say, God, I need you to fill me and lead me. I need your words in my mouth. I need your strength so I have courage to serve you. I need to keep my life clean and pure uh, because I want to be a spirit-led and spirit-directed person. And so I'd encourage you this week, keep reading chapter 11 to 15 and just turn your blinkers on and say, I want to see, I want to see more about how the Holy Spirit I used my brothers and sisters of old to spread the word of Christ and how it transformed people's lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day.
uh, for your many blessings. We pray for strength. We pray that we would be spirit-led people. We pray that we would see people come to know you. We realize that uh, salvation is your work. We are your messengers who call people to be reconciled to you. And even to this day, you are so gracious and that you are, your offer of salvation continues to be put out there that people would turn their lives over to you. But we know that we can't do that, Lord. That's your work. And so, but we pray that we would have the joy of seeing it. But we'd also pray that you would find us uh, as ones uh, not resisting you, but surrender to you and seeking to honor and glorify you. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> and there's uh, the offering is here. There's a closing song. And uh, there's some hand sanitizer here as well. <laughs>